There we go, we're recording. Okay, well, welcome everyone. As Karina just said, thank you so much for joining us today on this uh, uh, in our um, teaching and learning roundtable. Um, we've Karina and I have been. Uh, this is this is the spiel we always do. So if you've been before, you can turn off your ears for two seconds. Um, we've been running these now for the last year. Um, we. Uh, uh, we're supposed to be running a, a session at TAG last year, US TAG this time last year, about teaching and learning. Uh, it was all uh, online. Uh, well, it didn't happen online. And so we made, uh, it didn't happen at all because obviously of the global pandemic. So we uh, so we we started having sort of informal meetups uh, to talk about teaching and learning in archeology. span And we've sort of uh, begun to have, well, we've, we've ended up having one pretty much every month with a little bit of a gap over Christmas. Um, and we'll put our web address in the chat and you can have a look at previous sessions, some of which have been recorded and uh, are there to watch back if you're, if you're ever interested. And we're sort of building up a programme for the, the rest of the year. Um, and we're really grateful today to be collaborating in this one with uh, CIFA. Uh, so in the UK, that's the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, uh, our, our, our UK professional body. And we'll hand over to Cara in a little minute, who, who will uh, explain a little bit about sort of what CIFA have been doing about neurodiversity. Karina, we need to say some sort of housekeeping -y things. Yeah, right? so the, um, the session we're on today is we've got... Um, uh, three kind of short insights into the topic and then we'll break out into breakout rooms um, to talk a bit more about challenges and good practice and then we'll report back as a group. Um, usual Zoom etiquette applies which people are uh, mostly getting used to now. Um, keep yourself on mute unless you want to say something then um, raise, your, raise your hand uh, via Zoom. If we don't spot you, just we're quite a small group, just kind of uh, butt in us for a while if you haven't been asked to speak. Um, if you need to turn your cameras off for a while, that's absolutely fine. And it can help when people are speaking anyway, just to reduce bandwidth. Um, we kind of run on the principles of being kind of non-judgmental and a safe space for people to talk about their challenges and, um, and good practice. So just uh, bear that in mind when talking um, to each other and listening to each other. And yeah, just as Hannah mentioned, we'll record the session and we'll try and pull out bits of bits of the chat that have useful resources on and put those on our website. Um, yeah, as in the, the chat down the side, the chat box. So feel free at any point to share any kind of web links or, or anything within the chat or, or post any questions. After each of the speakers have spoken, um, we'll have a bit of space for a couple of, of questions uh, for them. Uh, and then uh, and then we'll, uh, as Karina said, we'll come back for a larger group discussion after the breakout rooms towards the end. So. You'll have noticed by now we're set normal. <laughs> Yes, uh, and that is the joy of this. So please do sort of uh, uh, use this sort of informal space for, for discussion. Um, and as we said before, we won't be recording the discussion parts of everything, just the papers. So um, shall we hand over to Cara just to sort of give a little bit of background about CIFA's work? <laughs> about all of this. The window cleaners are about to clean my windows during this, so I might have to turn my... <laughs> I'll hand over to Karina, uh, to Cara, sorry. Hi, Cara. <laughs> Hello. Um, no, brilliant. Hello, everyone. And um, thank you so much for Hannah and Karina for sort of collaborating on this session. Um, we were really keen to um, talk to this group about neurodiversity to sort of build on some of the work that CIFA or the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists has been undertaking for the last year or so. Um, we, um, we've been thinking about neurodiversity for a little while and last year um, working with Amy from the Mentoring uh, Women um, uh, in Heritage and Archaeology Network, um, we collaborated to create a survey of our members looking um, specifically at neurodiversity within our profession. And we've sort of followed that up with some comms work. Um, we're trying to have regular tea breaks where we're discussing it with our members and trying to learn a little bit more um, about um, neurodiversity in our profession. 
Now, that work has brought up some incredible case studies and some really, really positive stories that celebrate the strength of neurodiversity in our profession. Um, but it's also brought up um, some really, you know, quite awful stories where people have felt uncomfortable or unable to declare it. Um, and, you know, some instances where it's not, um, they've not been aided within their working or their career to um, work with their neurodiversity. So what we were really keen to do is to um, look at it at neurodiversity um, within universities, because we're really keen to sort of um, a try and establish a better conversation around neurodiversity in the profession, but also look at how students are supported and empowered um, with neurodiversity at university level and how they could potentially bring that empowerment into the profession. So things like being confident to declare it and asking for reasonable adjustments to celebrate their neurodiversity rather than seeing it as a negative. Um, so hopefully this is again just we're really we're a year into this we're really at the start of this work but hopefully events like this can just like keep the conversation going and try and um, improve the understanding of neurodiversity in our profession. Um, we'll put some links, oh Hannah's very helpfully put some links there on our neurodiversity um, webpage. I'm here with my colleague Alex, Alex Trellin, who's been working, um, we've been working on this together for the last year or so. Alex, do you have anything else you want to add if I miss anything out? Um, no, that's very comprehensive, Cara. I think everything you've said is perfect. Excellent. <laughs> Off to a good start. So I'll hand back to Hannah and Karina um, so we can get cracking with the talks. But thanks everyone for attending today. We're looking forward to hearing more. Thank you, Cara. Um, we'll launch straight into our first speaker, who is Professor uh, Penny um, Spikins from University of York, who is going to be setting the scene for us about the value of neuro neurodiversity. So I'll hand over to you, Penny. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Karina. Um, it's a real pleasure to be invited to this and it's been really wonderful to see how neurodiversity as a concept and inclusion of neurodiversity has been changing over the past few decades. Now I, I kind of stand in a slightly unusual position because I first got interested in neurodiversity nearly 20 years ago, that makes me feel really old now, um, and that was not long after Judy Singer first coined the phrase, phrase. that was in her thesis in the late 1990s. And back then it was considered a pretty weird thing to be interested in. Um, and it took a good few years before I ever got anything published. So people now tend to sort of say, oh, you've published quite a few things. I think, yeah, but if you look at the time over which it's happened, it doesn't sound nearly so impressive. Um, so it was really difficult initially just for people to understand the whole concept or to accept that it might be important. OK, so over that time, um, I guess my kind of the way in which I've engaged with neurodiversity as an archaeologist is particularly focused on autism. I'm going to come on to something else after that. Um, so I particularly looked at how autism played a role in our evolutionary or um, in our evolutionary origins. Um, first, setting out that idea that there were sort of complementary talents within autism, which were really critical. Um, to kind of our success as a species, if you want to say that, attention to detail in technology, understanding of how systems work, social tendencies to confront people who exploit others, all sorts of areas which we know sort of um, tends to be elevated within autism. And of course, afterwards, we found that genetics supported a positive selection for autism from around about 200,000 years ago. So that's all been one of the things I've written about. But then after that, I started to get interested in um, other archaeological areas, and particularly in terms of modern material culture. So, um, and also got some other people interested. So Barry Wright and John Schofield and a PhD student now, Callum Scott. Um, and we've looked at things like the relationship between autism and art and the potential role of autism in Upper Paleolithic art. We've looked at how uh, neurodiversity and autistic neurodiversity affects the value and meaning of personal possessions and the value and meaning between built heritage. So there's a, the paper on built heritage came out quite recently and it's open access just for this week. Um, but all of those papers, if you just put Spikin's autism into Google Scholar, you'll come up with all of those. But what they showed was actually something new that hadn't been discussed by psychologists who look at autism because they're not really interested in material culture. And that's that, uh, and it reflects that idea that actually neurodiversity 
is not just about autism is not just about social relationships it's about perception and I know in your introduction to this you talked about perception but so many people forget that this is about a whole perception of the world it's about how the world is understood and perceived um, and often those differences um, kind of play out as being advantageous in certain contexts and disadvantageous in others. And probably a good example of that is when we looked at the personal possessions research, we'll sort of ask, well, you know, if you're sent to a desert island, what would you take with you? And we found that along the autism spectrum, we've got, a, you know, a statistical correlation with differences between whether you were going to take photographs of your family or whether you were going to take something functional that might actually help you survive. And of course, it's not a great leap to realize that if a whole group of people are going to make it through the Paleolithic, you obviously need a set of different ways of looking at the world and different priorities and different values in order that you've got the whole lot with you when you're trying to survive in a new environment. So that's been really interesting. But I think the thing that's possibly meant most to me has been over the last year with COVID because, uh, well, Barry Wright was the first on this paper, because obviously, and I'm not sure how aware you are of this, but um, intensive care access had some influence on, there was a, um, within the UK and particularly in the US and other places, there were all these um, kind of assessment methods for who might get intensive care if it became rationed. And it did happen in certain places in the UK. And autism was one of the criteria. So autism would put a, like a sort of like, knock you down by one step um, in terms of rights to intensive care access if you got COVID. And so we wrote um, a very strong paper arguing against that and using the archaeological work to demonstrate how important people with autism were. And if anything, that's probably the thing I've been most proud of, which is not directly archaeological. It's the way in which the archaeology of neurodiversity has then had a very real impact um, on things that are happening today. And again, um, I'd want everyone to understand, if you say, what would you want everyone to understand about neurodiversity? It's that it's about both challenges and strengths. And many of those challenges really do seem to relate to our modern society. So dyslexia wouldn't have mattered in the past. No child with autism would have been expected to navigate those school environments with like large numbers of other kids or expected to put up their hand in class. So many of the challenges we face are simply about the context which we find ourselves in. And that idea of kind of, you know, the, the social model of disability um, is particularly clear within neurodiversity. It's the situation um, and the structure of society which imposes the challenges. But also I'd kind of like people to understand that archaeology has quite a role to play in wider discussions, partly because of our interest in the past um, and where we've come from, partly because we can look at how people in the past who were neurodiverse might have been integrated or included, partly because we look at material culture, which psychologists tend not to look at, um, and a lot of that is relevant for today. Um, but I think what we want to talk about today is not so much that, that area of research, but how we about inclusion within the discipline of archaeology now in a very practical sense and this sort of teaching and learning what happens at universities, how we foster inclusion. So I guess what I'd quite like to sort of talk about is when we use the term value, I'm always a little bit cautious about that, because it's easy for me to look and say, well, look, I can demonstrate all these ways in which someone with dyslexia or someone with autism may have, and everybody's always different, a certain way of perceiving the world that is useful. I mean, we've got a lot of talents associated with autism, but not everybody has those. But actually, when we talk about value, it's not about the value of an individual. Um, and I'm quite sort of strongly opposed to the idea that you could then say, look, this person uh, has value because of the talents that they hold. Uh, because really, it's about the value of neurodiversity as including all those different perspectives within society, but regardless of whether anyone themselves need a lot of support or don't need very much support or are incredibly vulnerable who aren't particularly vulnerable. Um, and I guess 
there's two things that is worth sort of mentioning here. And one is the role of structures and rules. And they're incredibly important. And I'm sure we'll get onto that later. You know, the law we have around disability is relevant for people with neurodiverse conditions. And as someone with dyslexia, I've benefited greatly from that kind of regional adjustments. Um, to briefly say in universities, we've got students and staff, everyone forgets staff, we've got so many staff, you forgot the staff, we have so many neurodiverse staff as well as students. Um, so students have student support plans and staff go through access to work, so there are different pathways to support. Um, and even though I've been diagnosed with dyslexia now for nearly 10 years, I only recently went through the whole access to work and got to what is now much better um speech to text uh, and i and my outputs has pretty much trebled since i had since i started using speech to text software all the time um which just goes to show how some of those adjustments and accommodations can be really effective but actually what i'd really like to say is i wanted to talk about three things and i'm sure there are many more that i think unite people or often unite people who have neurodiverse conditions. Um, because, and that's about the ways in which we find our experiences kind of united. Um, because one of the things I kind of strongly feel is that it's fine going on about adjustments and it's fine having the law and all of that is incredibly important. But if we want to go beyond that, we actually have to engage with what experience is. Because when we understand what others experience, then we've got much better ways of including them. And also when we engage with how people feel, it makes our jobs more rewarding in that inclusion. We're not just following tick boxes. And so I kind of strongly feel that the sort of let's give you the adjustments you're entitled to, it's not far enough. Uh, but then I know that not many, not everyone would agree with me. Many people would probably argue that, do you know what, what I want, I just want to be able to do my job. I just, you know, or I'm a student, I just want to be able to access everything and get on. I don't want people to understand me. So not everyone would agree with my perspective on that. But I've got three things, if I'm okay for time. I'm like, well, okay, for, I've got three more minutes to do three things. Yeah, three more minutes is, is okay. Thanks. Perfect. I've got three more minutes. I want to talk about three things that I think we probably often share. And I think my three things are shame, stress, and survival. Now, some of this is difficult, but um, I know when I first got to university, I was so proud to be there. I was so excited. I did my first essay. I worked all the work I, I could into it. And I was so excited to see what they would say about it. And I put lots of opinions. And I got back. I, before he accept F to C, you must learn how to spell. And he refused to give me any feedback until I could spell, which I clearly couldn't do ever. So that was like, and I think the thing about that, it's not just that you don't get any feedback, but it's also the sense that almost all of us have of shame, that we will have had repeated examples of being made to feel stupid, Pairs of people I'll email and people will write back and say oh you you might want to know you spelt that wrong or you might want to know and I can't do anything about it that's the point I can't perceive the difference build with an IU or UI I still don't know please don't tell me which way around it is because I can't remember it I perceive my particular dyslexia means I don't perceive details there's nothing I can do even if you tell me but there's that sense that like Tuesdays and Thursdays always get them confused, turn up to the meeting at the wrong time. It can be slightly hilarious, but at the same time, you have that sense that you don't really belong. You're not really using the right words in the right places. You're not really talking in the right way. You might mix words up, spell things wrong. And it's more than, obviously dyslexia is far more than spelling. You're, you're at the wrong time for the meeting. You turn up on the wrong day. You don't say, if you're tired, you get cognitive overload and you just can't get your words together at all. And all of those things mean that you very often feel that everybody else is living in a world that you're not quite part of. And I know that's true of many people with all it's that sense that like not really that we aren't capable there's nothing you can do to make that right um and I know I tend up thinking well people aren't going to think I'm stupid I'm just going to live with that I don't care anymore you know like they will think I'm probably stupid because of the way I spell or that I've turned up at the wrong day and that's the second one stress I think all of us because we bend around everyone else and I know colleagues with autism that are like why do people want me to look into their eyes why do I have to do that some people with autism are happy with that many aren't why do they need to and I genuinely don't know why things like spelling matter 
I think like there's so much going on in the world. Get all those people dying of COVID. Should you care how I spell build? Why the, on earth do you, does that matter? Because surely you can tell what I meant. But actually, I always lose that argument because there's something morally good. You know, there's something morally good about looking in people's eyes. Why? You know, I mean, I do. I don't have autism. I, I am dyslexic. But at the same time, like, I'm like, well, why? Why do you need me to spell things right? Surely it doesn't matter. But there's a morality that you feel you don't belong to. And then my last one, survival. So we've all been knocked back. We've all had a sense of shame. We've all been much more stressed than many other people might on average be loads of people have stress and anxiety but most of us have more because we're trying to adapt to a world that our brains aren't set up to adapt to and that means we've survived and we've been knocked back but we've learned a lot of resilience and those three things and there's probably many more are things that I'd really like anyone thinking about inclusion to think about beyond the practicalities but being aware that by the time you start to talk to people, they're probably already upset. They might even be angry because they've been living this for such a long time. Anyway, I should stop now because I think I've got to the end and probably even possibly gone over. I hope not. Um, but it would be lovely to discuss with you some of those things. Thank you, Penny. So does anyone have um, an immediate question for Penny? Second. Oh, Cara? Oh, oh. Yeah, don't, Sorry, I'm, I'm doing the awful thing and I'm actually putting my hand up. Um, okay, this um, Penny, what do you think? Um, we're exploring looking at neurodiversity awareness raising training for um, our CIFA members. It, have you had much experience with that? And do you think that is something that could start make inroads into some of the misunderstandings you've just referenced there? Oh, you're just on mute at the moment. Sorry. Want to hear all your beautiful words <laughs> <laughs> no 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 sorry sorry mm -hmm. um it's really interesting you raised that because we're looking at that at york about how to do actually we're looking at some disability awareness training and neurodiversity within that as well um and i think we felt there are two levels one is a fairly quick rapid one which is sort of 30 minute online and almost the best you're going to get from that and that's still useful is making sure people don't make mistakes giving people a bit of a, a bit of a background but we've also sort of felt that if you really want to understand, you probably need some of those half day courses where you get someone who's got lived experience who really engages. But I mean, both of that, if, if, all, you've, if all you can do is a 30 minute online, then, then do a 30 minute online. It just, it's just, there's several levels there. There's not, you know, there's not just one solution, but there are several solutions and getting into a thing in a bit more detail gets you a little bit further. Don't know if I helped you. Um, uh, Suzanne? Uh, one of the questions uh, that I was thinking, like how much of, you know, the corrections that you're getting, do you think like that you're attributing to being neurodiverse could actually be attributed to just being a woman? Um, and are you seeing an intersection between that? Because I see plenty of uh, men who misspell all the time and, or, you know, and I don't think people have that same instinct of correcting them or miss you know, misspeak or whatever as they do towards women. So how do you attribute, you know, one to the other? Like, mm. yeah, and also like, you know, if I misspell something sometimes, well, now I feel like it's autocorrect, <laughs> you know, like that, that's also, do you see any other, so a second question is, yeah. do you see any lessening of that correction now that people, everybody's having their autocorrect do all sorts of crazy stuff? Okay, yeah, that, that really interesting. There are two things. One is kind of the, the intersectionality of being a woman, and it's very hard to tease that apart. Um, I think something, I mean, maybe this is paranoia, but something about the way I speak, because I don't often use complicated words. I've had people write and say, I absolutely love your writing style. You've got the most appro approachable writing style I know. We love listening to that, and we love write, reading it. It's the easiest to read. And I think, well, you know, there are some people there who are not so impressed with it, I imagine. Um, I do actually understand that some of it is being a woman. I was in a workshop not a year, 
over a year ago so a physical workshop and someone I do you know human evolution and a guy was telling me that that you know um did you know that humans are sexually dimorphic and I just thought like do you know like firstly it's not I don't need to teach that I only need to be a human to notice that (laughs) like you know I can notice that men are bigger you know taller than women I without but I also teach human evolution and you end up I I tend just to let it go all the time I don't know whether I should but there is an intersection but also don't forget it's not you know dyslexia is not just about spelling so I will turn up for the wrong time turn up to a meeting in the wrong place there's a lot of those kind of things so I don't really know the answer to that (laughs) Uh, but I think there is a complicated thing in terms of spelling I mean now I use like speech to text so it's more a matter of there are odd words but I think there's still a kind of correction of the way you speak that's perhaps a little bit more difficult to tease apart I don't know if that's answered that Thank you. Thank you for a really fascinating oversight. Thank you, Penny. That was uh, great. And we'll, we'll come back to you at the end as well. Um, for our next slot, we've got um, Megan Schlanker, who is uh, um, a recent graduate. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Megan wasn't able to be here in person, so she sent her a recording. So I'm just going to share my screen. Bear with me a moment. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah, yes, we can see it. Megan, um, I studied at the University of Birmingham uh, doing archaeology and ancient history from 2016 to 2019. Um, and I also recently graduated from the University of York, um, where I did my master's in bioarchaeology. Um, I was also diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder when I was about 10 years old, um, which sort of at the time helped everything sort of click into place for me. Um, I'd always been a little bit different, um, so (laughs) it really helped um, to be able to put a name to the things that I was experiencing and the sort of traits I had. Um, I really really struggled with exams in school um i remember one history exam when i just started crying because everyone else had finished and i was i hadn't even written a page yet um whereas in sort of normal non-exam conditions i was i was doing well so it didn't really add up it wasn't actually until I was around 18 um, that I was assessed for sort of dyslexia and dyspraxia um, and I got diagnosed again with an unspecified <laughs> specific learning difficulty um, which sort of affects the speed that my uh, brain processes, in, processes information and particularly the, uh, the messages that it sends to the rest of me. <laughs> which means I've got quite a slow handwriting speed in particular. The, the past couple of years as a student there are quite a few things that have been done well and have really helped me um, and there's also a couple of things that have gone as well. Um, I'm just going to touch on some of those experiences for a minute. Um, so one of the things I felt went really well was that I uh, got disabled students allowance. Um, This wasn't financial for me, this was um, a series of reasonable adjustments. Um, So I was given extensions to any assignments if I needed it. Um, I was also given 25% extra time in exams as well as rest breaks, my own room um, and the use of a laptop. So each of those things sort of helped me in different ways. Um, the laptop was because it takes me a long time to write letters down. Um, so I type a lot faster than I handwrite. So I was given a laptop to sort of help with that and help me get my thoughts down quicker. Um, the extra time is obviously similar reasons. If you have a slower processing speed or if you are more anxious in an exam setting um, 
the extra time really helps. Um, <laughs> the rest breaks definitely came in handy in my longer exams. Um, there were a couple of exams that I had which I would start them at I think around like 8 or 9 in the morning uh, and I wouldn't be out before lunchtime. Um, so I would use my rest breaks to, to have a little bit of food and have like a little bit of a, a breather. Um, so I do think that's a really helpful thing that I think a lot of people aren't aware is available um, as part of Disabled Students Alliance. Um, I was also given as part of that some software that I still use today. Um, so I was given some mind map software, which uh, I will sort of recommend to anyone that says that they have trouble sort of organising their thoughts. Um, because it is so helpful because there's no real commitment to the ideas that you're putting down um, when you're planning so like an essay or something. Uh, so I really found that helpful. Um, and I also got some recording software so I could record lectures I was in. Um, luckily for me, uh, University of Birmingham record all of their lectures like as policy. So I didn't have to uh, sort of sit at the front of the class near <laughs> the lecturer every time and make sure that I'd got my recording equipment with me and make sure my laptop was fully charged um, because everything was already pre-recorded. So I tended to make notes in the lecture and then I'd go over them again and add to my notes because I couldn't um, take notes as fast as people were talking. Um, so I'd make like the key notes and then I'd go back and, and add things in and then I'd go over when it was time to revise for exams I'd go over it again and add even more in um, which was a like a good technique I found. <laughs> some of the other good things were I came across some very understanding members of staff um, these also included staff that were neurodiverse themselves um, and that was really nice in a way because I got to see that there are people like me that do achieve things <laughs> um, and that you can still, you can need um, or you can be offered these sorts of reasonable adjustments um, and then you can still get somewhere in life because um, one of the sort of put downs that people have said is well if you don't get these adjustments in real life then how are you going to get anywhere? Um, for me in particular it was exam settings and in real life you don't really get many sort of exam settings um, but it was nice to be able to to see sort of a, a future for myself um, by talking to these like academics that had similar um, like conditions and traits to me also came across staff who were just sort of willing to listen. Um, so I would explain my situation to them and instead of uh, either shrugging it off or seeing me as um, sort of a, a typical diagnosis, they'd see me as a whole person who also has these particular um, traits because I think one of the issues that I've had quite a lot is that I will introduce myself before people have ever met me um, and I'll mention that I'm autistic and suddenly the way that people behave towards me changes completely, the way that the things that they think that I'm capable of change completely. Um, they're like, oh, you won't be able to have a conversation, which is not accurate to me. It might be accurate to other people, but it isn't. Um, representative of the sort of <laughs> condition that I have. Also had a support system of other neurodiverse students, which I found really helpful. This sort of happened accidentally, um, but it is something that I think might be really useful to sort of try and implement um, as a, maybe even like a Zoom support group little chat um, or Facebook group or anything like that, because again it was really sort of valuable to know that I wasn't alone and that I wasn't going th through things alone 
uh, one of the things that I sort of <laughs> bonded with one of my friends at undergrad about was that neither of us knew how to tell the time until we were adults on an analog clock because it's just too many variables and it moves while you're trying to tell the time <laughs> so we'd both really struggled with that and for years we thought that it was something that was just sort of stupid that we couldn't do and then we got a name for it and having that name for it and being able to talk to each other about something that we had a mutual experience with which is really helpful and really sort of took the sting out of it but gone less well um, I did have some issues with my reasonable adjustments that caused quite a bit of additional stress, um, particularly at undergrad. Um, I had uh, quite a lack of support from the key worker that I was assigned at undergrad, um, which meant that arrangements weren't made properly. Um, I turned up to an exam in my third year and I was told that I wasn't entitled to a laptop, which wasn't true and luckily the um, the people in the office knew me and knew that it wasn't true. Um, I was also put in a main room rather than in a room on my own uh, in first year before I reached out and was a bit confused because I was given a seat number um, and if I hadn't have reached out I'm, I, I'm not sure how well that would have gone. Um, there was also some sort of just poor communication in general. Um, so I was once told that I'd failed a module despite the fact that I'd been granted an extension. Um, and I also wasn't told that afternoon exams, if you have extra time, start an hour early. So I was leaving for my exam and I got a phone call to ask where I was. Um, Again, luckily, the people in the office understood that there'd been a lapse in communication and they uh, allowed me to take a little break to calm down and then start my exam. I think that neurodiversity is the good thing. I think it really uh, helps. I think a lot of the stuff that CIF has been doing um, recently show that it's a uh, a positive to the sort of archaeological community to have so many different ways of thinking um, and I know that people who are like on the autism spectrum and people with dyslexia are sort of represented quite heavily in the profession um, it's definitely something that I've picked up on um, both like during my studies and since I've started working in commercial um, that it is almost sort of a perfect job for people whose brains work a little bit differently. Well, thank you uh, for, for uh, that. Karina, Karina was sharing the screen uh, and uh, uh, Alex had uh, uh, helped edit a, a little bit. Um, and as we explained, unfortunately, um, uh, Megan uh, can't, can't be here. But um, if you have any questions, we can we can pass them on uh, to her. It's really interesting, really important to have the student perspective. Um, but I think so. We've so we've sort of heard sort of uh, Penny's Penny's perspective, bringing us giving us a kind of overview. We've heard a student perspective, and now we want to sort of move slightly differently. I'm going to hand over to Karina to to introduce our next speaker. Yeah. So. Um really pleased to have Emma Brown join us, who's one of my colleagues here at University of Bradford. Uh, she's on, uh, in an from an archaeological background and has also just recently set up a neurodiversity staff network at Bradford. So I'll hand over to Emma. Thanks, Emma. Well, hi. So um, I'm really delighted to be here and be able to speak to you uh, this afternoon. So as Karina said, um, I do have an archaeology background. I did my MSc in human osteology and paleopathology at the University of Bradford in 2006-07. And I came back a year later to complete my PhD in bioarchaeology, uh, graduating in 2013 um, with a good PhD with minor corrections, which I thought was pretty good, actually. Now, I've always been a bit of a bit different. Um, I not great at picking up subtext, I'm not particularly well organised and I was quite a strange child. So my favourite toy when I was a child was a VHS video cassette. Now 
as I graduated, I was really, really struggling uh, with some pretty brutal mental health problems. I, I was uh, just couldn't organize myself. I was really struggling. So I left academia because I just, I wasn't coping very well. Due to a restructure at the university, I then had to leave the university and that change in routine and being in a completely different environment pushed me into a complete breakdown in 2016. Um, I'll spare you the ugliest details, but what came out of that was me doing some research and reading about um, autism in women. And it was like a light went on for me. And I read, I, I read this, it was a BBC article and I read it and I went, oh. So I, I did a bit of research and I did the screening tests and I got my uh, school reports and took them to my GP and I said to her, I think I'm autistic. And she went, okay, why do you think that? And we talked about it and she said, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to refer you. So that took a year um, to get, actually assessed. So I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, or I prefer autism spectrum condition because I don't believe I'm disordered, in 2017 when I was 33. So I'd already gone through all of my education completely undiagnosed and unsupported. So it's not that surprising that I was completely burnt out by the end of it. And um, so during my assessment, um, I, I was a very lovely consultant clinical psychologist. And we're talking about some of my other issues. It's like, you're definitely autistic, but there's something else there, but um, you're not paying for that assessment. So we will just move on. And he suggested, maybe you've got ADHD as well. Like, okay. Uh, so I, you know, I, I had, I was grateful. I had some answers of why I've been struggling. Um, my employer at the time were not particularly understanding and I really had to fight for some accommodations, which was basically I could have my noise cancelling headphones on. I was working in an open plan office with 50 other people. And when you experience um, sensory overload um, and you can't filter out background noise, it's not a great environment. Uh, so I kind of lived with that kind of that thing at the back of my head thinking, you know, maybe there is something else here. Um, you know, I wasn't completely dealing with my various issues. And so one of my major problems is around executive functioning and sequencing tasks and organizing things. Um, so I mean, it affects every part of my life. I mean, I don't drive because I, I really struggle with, like, I guess, organizing my own brain to do the various different movements. But also um, my brain just kind of logs out. Like, you know, when you leave a laptop for a bit for five minutes, it kind of just goes, shuts down through inactivity. That's my brain, but I don't want it to, it just does that. And it's very, very frustrating. So eventually about a year and a half ago, I went to my GP again and said, I think I've got ADHD. And she was like, why do you think that? And I, and I did all the tests and did the research. And she was like, I'm going to refer you. So it was again, another, year now I don't know if anyone um, I'm, I'm assuming other people will kind of realize how bad it is to get access diagnosis in this country when you're an adult and you're neurodivergent it's a nightmare so I was put on a waiting list and I was told at the time and this was before covid that um the average wait time in my area was 21 months um which was not not great um but in December last year the rules um around the way CCGs pay and um, commission services changed. So I got a phone call on Christmas Eve from my GP to say, I'm referring, I can now refer you to a private um, service who will do your assessment. So I was referred um, and I had my assessment for ADHD in January this year. And I was diagnosed with combined type ADHD, which is, so I show examples um, of impulsivity, hyperactivity and inattention so I, I like to call it the combo deal um, at the moment there's the DSM recognizes three types of ADHD so the primarily inattentive which is the kind the daydreamers the space cadets the uh, hyperactive uh, type which is the archetypal little boy who can't sit still and then the combined type um, which is quite hard to diagnose and um, I had a very interesting conversation with my psychiatrist who said, you, you're autistic and you've also got ADHD. So you've got features of both. Um, 
So I mean, I don't have that hyper attention to detail that autistic people do. I've got the ADHD thing where I have got like a 30 second attention span, which is not helpful at times. Um, so, so yeah, that's where I am now. So I'm fairly recently diagnosed with ADHD. It wasn't a shock. Um, so when I came back to Bradford in July, 20, July 2019, um, I joined the Disability Staff Network just, just to, for a bit of support because I was still going through diagnosis and I was still kind of processing, finding out you're neurodivergent when you're in your 30s, which is actually quite difficult. Um, and there was a message that went around the notice, the, the, the mailing list, and it said basically, um, it was a member of staff who said, I've had a student who's come to me, he's autistic, and he's really struggling with um, the amount of information he receives over email because too much information is a problem for autistic people. My, if I get too much information, my brain just goes, nope, and I kind of shut down. Um, there was some discussion on about how we best support this student. Um, and what came out of it is I ended up meeting another autistic person. And I was so excited. I was like, there's somebody else like me. So we met up and we had a discussion and um, we, we hit it off right away. And we're like, well, actually we probably, the needs of neurodivergent people are, qu are quite different to the kind of, I guess, almost standard disability stuff. There's a lot more, I think there's a lot more, it, there's differences there. So we're like, should we start a staff network? So we went to our, um, she's now Pro Vice Chancellor for Equality, Diversity, Inclusion said, we would like to start a neurodivergent staff network and she was massively supportive um so we launched sadly we launched like about three weeks before covid hit so that's been quite difficult um to to get a lot of engagement so we we have we did launch and we're at the moment kind of still trying to get engagement and but the kind of heartbreaking thing that i've found um is you know we had quite a lot of people like maybe 30 people contact us but these people there's a you know a lot of mostly of other autistic people who are absolutely terrified of of admitting to their line managers and to hr that they're autistic um so trying to get the engagement in the network with people who are absolutely terrified of disclosing that they're autistic. It's, it's been an uphill challenge of trying to get that engagement. We've got a couple of people now who are engaged and we're trying to develop our terms of reference to, to move that forward. But it's just something that um, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm quite privileged and I, that I have a formal diagnosis and I really don't care at this point what people think of me. Like I know why I'm like I am, but other people don't have that. And it is, it's incredibly difficult. And I think certainly for, um, you know, I'm involved in like online advocacy and the younger people coming through are so much more knowledgeable um, and so much more confident about talking about neurodiversity and difference. But the people that I'm working with in the, the network are older and they still have some of those. There's a lot of internalized ableism and shame around their condition which is really, it's heartbreaking because these people have not declared, they're not getting support at work and are not necessarily struggling, but probably not flourishing as much as they could if they had some support. Um, so yeah, um, I would agree with, I, like, I really enjoyed listening to the other speakers because actually like, there's, um, even though we've all got slightly different flavors of neurodiversity, there's a lot of commonality there. So um, I definitely with looking back at, at Penny's talk and talking about shame and stress and actually it is incredibly stressful and um, particularly when um, you're going through diagnosis, the diagnostic process as an adult, it's incredibly stressful. People don't really understand and there's a lot of stigma around some of these conditions that people think that you know that you as an autistic person that I, I, I can't display empathy or that I couldn't you know, um, have, well, like have a conversation, which, you know, clearly I can. Um, so there's, there's the stigma busting that we need to do and there's education we need to do and awareness raising of actually quite how differently people can present. So um, nobody's really touched on it really, but 
certainly with autism, ADHD, dyspraxia in particular, um, women and people assigned female at birth in general tend to be missed. We tend to get our diagnosis much later in life and miss out on that early support. So, I mean, that's feeding into things like mental health problems, you know, failing at university or failing in school or and just not maybe not thriving and not getting the best out of neurodivergent people, which I think is a real tragedy because, you know, lots of neurodivergent people have really specific, very strong skills in certain areas. And I think we're not taking advantage of that. And that's a real shame. So um, I'm not sure if people are um, aware uh, uh, last year, uh, the Institute of Leadership and Management did a survey of employers and asked them about employing people with different neurological and neurodivergent conditions. And they found uh, that 50% of employers would not employ people with neurodivergent condition. It's completely illegal under the Equality Act. And the greatest bias was against ADHD and Tourette's. So I think it was six out of 10 for both of those, those employers were like, oh, not, we're not comfortable with employing people with those conditions. I think autism was about five out of 10. Um, the worst uh, actually industry was construction engineering. So, um, which is not, it's, it's really quite distressing. And we also, they also looked at um, HR policies and they've actually the vast majority of HR policies have no provision for, for neurodivergence or supporting neurodivergent people, but also dealing with people who are being bullied because of their neurodivergence. So I guess what we're trying to do now um, at the University of Bradford with our network is trying to deal with a lot of these issues. So the university have taken it very seriously. We have um, an executive board um, advocate so we have the university secretary who's uh, the exec board um, advocate at a very high level for neurodiversity. He's very engaged. He's willing to, he's really willing to learn. Um, and we've had these conversations about people diagnosing their conditions, um, uh, the kind of stigma and um, that people face and how we deal with things like, with, with things like bullying. And uh, because it's something, you know, something close to my heart, I was, um, basically bullied in one of my one of my jobs not at the University of Bradford I hasten to say they've been great um basically for my neurodivergent or my um, particularly my autistic and ADHD traits that um it was a job that basically managed to expose all of my weaknesses and I was they tried to performance manage me but without any kind of reasonable adjustments and so you can imagine how well that went um the things I, I um, like other people here, have been through access to work. Um, I've just had all of my, my grant um, approved. So my reasonable adjustments are I have um, external screens to help me with uh, processing. Um, I, I really prefer people to communicate me with to me um, in writing because I have auditory processing issues. So I don't necessarily pick up instructions um, so if you want something done, please, please send me an email. It will work much better. Um, I wear uh, noise cancelling headphones a lot. Um, I, I, these, these have changed my life, particularly when I was commuting. I, I, I experienced sensory overload. I'm not great at bright lights. So, I, um, so actually working from home during COVID has been great because I can control my um, environment much better and I've had those those conversations with other people in our network actually this has been great because I can control my environment um, but the lack of structure and support has been like the flip side has actually been very difficult so yeah so the university does take neurodivergence uh, very seriously we feed into um, policy review um, we've helped, um, we've fed into things like the COVID recovery plans when we're talking about things like changing routine um, and keeping and about uh, comms plans, about clear communication, about communicating what's expected and what's changing, and just being very clear about that. So we're starting to make an impact and now we're, you know, and I'm starting to become more involved in that kind of a wider community, which has been, which has been fantastic. So I think I will stop waffling there. Um, but I'm very happy to answer any questions that people have got. Thank you, Emma. 
I can't see any hands, so I'm going to kick in with the, the first question. I'm wondering, um, from your perspective, do you think that there's anything that um, lecturers could be doing differently to be more supportive? I think um, just if um, taking the support plans seriously, and I've, I've had, I've heard a mixture of things um, from students at our university. Um, but I think the real, the real key thing, I think for um, most flavors of neurodivergence is just clear communication um, about what's expected. Um, don't expect people to read in between the lines uh, because we, lots of us are not very good at that. Um, and I think that's, that's very important. But I think at the moment, things are incredibly difficult because lots, things change very quickly. And the, the disruption of routine and uncertainty is a, everyone struggles, but neurodivergent people really, really struggle with that kind of uncertainty. So trying to keep things, I guess, as predictable as possible, um, even though that's incredibly difficult at the moment. Thank you so much. Does, did anyone want, have any sort of specific questions for Emma? I think um, we're conscious that as ever, we uh, run over time. Oh, uh, uh, like we've run out over time. It, so we won't have discussion uh, um, breakout rooms. Um, I think we'll sort of stop the recording in a set in a second and then we can have a broader discussion. But I guess I just noticed that Suzanne had her hand up. So um, I'll, I'll Suzanne, I'll let you put your question to Emma. Hi, thank you for that um, presentation. So it's um, I guess a question. Uh, I always have two. I have two questions. Actually, I have many. But um, one question I had with the student support plans, because I do work with a lot of students who uh, often I feel like I'm the one who refers them to the, uh, uh, we call it accessibility services here. And like nobody ever told them about it. And that's really hard because, mm. you know, and I think it might be because of stigma and things like that. But, you know, often like right now, we are pretty far into our term and it's only now I'm hearing from students about these problems because things have piled up for them a bit. Um, and so part of the problem I found is that they wait really late and even with these plans, right? Like, so I, I guess my question is how, when you say to work with students on their support plans and like try to accommodate, you know, with those plans, like how, how, how does that actually happen? Because if the students are not as willing to, or just, you know, they don't want to communicate a lot. Um, is it that we work, we should work with the, the office, the ARS office? Because I think they just check off things. So I don't know specifically. Um, so how do you I recommend that? I suspect there's a huge variation between universities um, and how those services. So I know, for example, my own institution flags it immediately. As soon as they enroll, they're like, and they call it disability services here, which actually, interestingly, the students really don't like the term disability. Um, there, um, there is a stigma around that. Personally, I don't think disability is a dirty word, but our younger students are actually quite struggling with it. I think, I think it's all about flagging services early, and may, maybe in your introductory, into your in your introductory sessions into your modules, is actually flag it and say these services are available. Um, and I think just trying to get them through early, but I'm also aware that actually some assessments just take time. So I think at the beginning, I certainly, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that things come in late. I've, I've also seen that in my own institution as well. Um, and I think as well, I guess as a wider education that we really do need to stigma bust some of these conditions. Um, and I, but I think that's a long-term, a long-term project. So you think it's the stigma that keeps them from... Definitely, I do. I, and that's exactly what I've heard from uh, the head of disability services who, I, who I'm who I'm now talking to around kind of awareness, awareness raising things that we would like to do. But the, to the point that students don't want disability services to be called disability services. So I, there's, there's, there's stigma there, there's, there's, there's ableism, there's a misunderstanding of what the conditions are, um, a lot of negative particularly around autism, um, there's some really actually quite upsetting things that people say um, when you when you disclose. Um, so 
yeah, it's, it can be difficult, but I think just um, being non-judgmental and understanding, and the fact that the fact that you're engaging is just is just, massively positive. And I guess the follow-up is um, just once they have done that, so that has happened, you know, that they have then registered, but then, you know, um, I have like a student right now who, you know, I actually, the way I framed it first, like, I need you, like, if this is something that you're eligible for, I need you to do it. So that unleashes me as a professor to give you all sorts of accommodations I want to, but I can't do without getting into kind of trouble in a way. Mm. Um, and so, so sometimes that's what works, but then the problem is like after they've done that, so I have all the documentation, but then like, should I be emailing to, you know, follow up like more regularly or like if they don't want to communicate, you know, like maybe part of the issue is they can't be on a screen or that, you know, like, but we're in Zoom land. So yeah. like, how do you, how do you recommend, um, or do you have any recommendations for how to then help the but, student keep to the support plan yeah. as the instructor? Um, uh, so um, lots of neurodivergent people have ish various issues with communication. Autism is a deficit in uh, reciprocal communication or something or other. So finding out actually how the student wants to communicate would, is a really good start. So I hate phone calls. Uh, I, I, I have auditory processing issues. So I only pick up part of what someone says. And I have sometimes a, if it's if I'm also experiencing um, sensory to like too much sensory stuff if the light's too bright or there's too much background noise I also get a delay it's very strange I didn't realize what this was until like I was 35 um so finding out the best way to communicate I think is a really good start and, and finding out those communication preferences that make them at ease so that may be through email it might be zoom it might be phone call it might be emails just find out what how they like to communicate first and I think that's probably the biggest barrier. But also, I mean, the student, I mean, I like if you're finding out that you've got a condition, you know, in your late teens, your twenties, you're at university, is that there's actually a lot of emotional processing that goes, like I, I certainly went through a whole period of just reframing my entire life and my experiences and what I thought had gone wrong were actually re reframing so that can be quite difficult and quite difficult to talk about I didn't talk about it very much um so there's this possibly that aspect as well that actually can be quite difficult and to talk about and expose your vulnerability um so again and it's and I guess building that relationship with trust with the student as well will be be pretty key as well that's just my, just my tuppence. Thank you so much, Emma. I'm going to just stop the recording and then we can sort of have a broader discussion.